afternoon. <clears throat> My name is uh, Larry Korb, and I'd like to welcome you to this uh, session in which uh, Ellen Tauscher, Congressman Tauscher, Congresswoman Tauscher, who'll be here in about an hour, and uh, the author, Dr. Nathaniel Frank, will discuss the policy of don't ask, uh, don't tell. Let me begin by asking everybody, please turn off your cell phones, pagers, and all of that uh, type, of, type, of, type of thing. <clears throat> and uh, let me make a few comments before I, I turn it over to, uh, to, to, doc, to Dr. Frank. Um, I got involved in this uh, issue uh, back in 1981 when I came into uh, government in the Pentagon. And what had happened was that literally on his way out of office, President Carter and then the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense had issued an order saying basically that homosexuality was incompatible with military service. Previous to that, it really had been up to the commander of a unit to, uh, to make a decision. In fact, <clears throat> when I was in the service in the 60s, there were people who were gay, and, but basically nobody said anything, nobody seemed to care. And unless there were some problems caused by them or anybody where the, the commanding officer could uh, get somebody out for reasons of good order, <clears throat> nothing really was, uh, was, was done about it. And in fact, if you know anything about the history of that period, you know that we did have a thing called the draft and conscription. A lot of people would try and get out by uh, saying that uh, they were, and so it just became kind of a, a, a non-issue. And when I came into the Reagan administration and the policy of homosexuality being incompatible with military service, a lot of the military chiefs used that to really uh, get rid of a, a lot of people. Even some people who, when they were drafted, had said they were gay, but they got drafted anyway. Uh, and <clears throat> a lot of people, because of the, uh, the fact that uh, the policy had been issued at the end of the Carter administration assumed it was the right-wing Republicans, you know, who were doing that. And as I would go around and talk about that issue, we were always were blaming it on Reagan. And when I would point out, no, it was the Carter administration, it surprised an awful, an awful lot of uh, people. Now, during the, uh, basically during the 80s, the big issue in manpower was not the gay uh, issue. It was basically women in the military because uh, President Carter had given the military numbers to meet in terms of the, the number of women that they, would, uh, that they would have. And again, thinking here, you had the right-wing Republicans coming in, we can get rid of all of these women. They tried to lower the goals that uh, they were given. And <clears throat> uh, we were able to stop that primarily because my boss, Cap Weinberger, had been secretary of what then was known as HEW and had instituted a thing called Title IX. And when I explained that to the services, they recognized they shouldn't push that issue uh, too much. Now, of course, <clears throat> when uh, President uh, Clinton uh, talked about uh, this issue in the, in the campaign, of course, it came right to the fore. And, and then, of course, we had the, the compromise that resulted in don't ask, uh, don't tell. So that's uh, really kind of a, pre a prelude to what I'm going to, uh, Dr. Frank is going to talk about. And <clears throat> he'll speak for, uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I'll ask him some questions and we'll open it up to you. And then uh, Congresswoman Tauscher will be here about uh, 2 o'clock. Let me begin by uh, introducing uh, Dr. Frank and, and I'll also introduce uh, Congressman Tauscher, even though she's not here. So when she gets here, we can uh, save, <coughs> save some time. Uh, Dr. <clears throat> Nathaniel Frank is a senior research fellow at the Palm Center at the University of California, Santa Barbara and an adjunct professor of history at uh, NYU. You must spend a lot of time going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> it's a real shame. <laughs> OK, he's a historian with a doctorate from Brown. And he's pro probably, and I, I don't think just probably, he is the most widely published journalist on the military's current policy on gays in the military. <clears throat> he twice broke the story of army purges of gay Arabic translators in the New Republic. And his publications on gays in the military, uh, in addition to his book, which is out there, uh, have appeared in the Times, the Post, the LA Times, Slate, Newsday, Philadelphia, Inquirer. Uh, and he's been interviewed on uh, innumerable programs, uh, including Good Morning America and the uh, CBS Evening, Evening News. In fact, he was uh, on CNN right before he came here. So, uh, Dr. Frank, if you would uh, 
uh, make a few opening remarks about the subject and what your own research has uh, uh, said about the policy. Uh, then uh, I will ask you a few questions about it. Thank you. Actually, my opening remarks are about the snow. I want to thank everyone <laughs> for tre trudging through the snow. It looks like it's picked up again, so we may be all stuck here for a while because that seems to be the way Washington works. Uh, th uh, thank you all coming out, and thank you to Larry. I I'm very um, excited to be here at the Center for American Progress uh, because I've always respected what uh, the center has done in such a short time, and also because um, S several of the people who are part of this center uh, have been part of the history that I have studied um, to write up the book, including Larry, as he mentioned, and I, as I think we'll talk a bit more about. Um, I'm also really excited because the uh, Center for American Progress shares with the Palm Center, which is where I'm a research fellow but non-resident, which is why I'm not on the West Coast. Um, they share a commitment not only to progressive politics but, uh, but to the focus on knowledge and research to getting us there to getting the country to move in a in a progressive direction. So um, I'm, I'm very excited to speak about that. And it's this question of knowledge that drew me to this issue uh, from the from the beginning. Um, so I'm going to frame my my remarks um, with that idea of knowledge at the top, and then divide my opening remarks into two. Um, first, I'll share some of um, what I think are sort of the more surprising revelations that I found in doing my research for the, for the book. And then I'll raise the question briefly, does the policy work? Is this a good policy or a failed policy? Is it a good use of, of our resources and is it wise, wise policy? I, I want to frame the discussion, as I said, around this issue of knowledge. Because remember that the fight over gays in the military in the early 90s uh, was not a fight about whether homosexuality is compatible with the military. It was a fight about whether knowledge of homosexuality was compatible with the military. It was a question of whether, ultimately, whether gay and lesbian service members should be allowed to say that they're gay. And so by extension, to me, it was about whether America was able to confront the truth and, uh, and to speak about things that sometimes make people uncomfortable, um, but that are realities, um, that humans are sexual beings and that there are people who are different uh, and that that difference can be a source of strength and not a threat. So for me, this was a, a really a very postmodern policy. It wasn't uh, like some other civil rights battles. It wasn't so much about resources or even status, although that was a part of it. It was about knowledge and express, expression um, and about being able to, to say what's true. Um, so the debate, I think, tested Americans. And it, and it raised the question of who are we as Americans? Um, and how we answer that question, I think, now will shape, to some extent, who we are as Americans in the 21st century. So I, I argue uh, that this policy is broader than just being about uh, gays and lesbians or just about gays and lesbians in the military. It's a, it raises questions about the role of research um, and the identity of Americans. That's the frame. Um, I, I argue in Unfriendly Fire that Don't Ask, Don't Tell is a policy that's rooted in denial and deception and repression. And I, I argue that it's important beyond gay rights for some of the reasons uh, that I've said. And I think that my interest in sort of the role of knowledge and self-deception um, is even more resonant now as we uh, understand a bit more about um, how uh, exotic mortgages and um, pyramid investment schemes and these banking schemes uh, really have consequences, that when you base policy on self-deception and denial, that there are consequences. And um, I'm heartened that the government is now speaking about transparency. And I think that uh, you know, truth in budgeting and lifting the ban on photographing the coffins of our fallen, um, these are important steps toward being able to, to speak the truth. Um, as Larry said, there have been numerous instances of research conducted on the issue of gays in the military, going all the way back to the 1950s, when uh, the, the Crittenden report um, first found that gays and lesbians were not a security risk. And that report was buried, and it was forced out by court order. And the same thing happened in the 80s with the Perserex studies, when Larry was instrumental in, in realizing from, from that situation, these were military studies, government studies, that again and again concluded that gays are not a security risk. In fact, gays 
in the military um, is not a problem. And each time, the government, the military itself, um, denied that the studies existed, tried to bury them, refused to release them, labeled them drafts, and so forth. Um, something similar happened around Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It was a congressional policy, ultimately. That was sort of the outcome of the battle, of Clinton's promise to lift the ban, and then Congress, under Sam Nunn, especially in the military, under uh, Colin Powell, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs, saying, no way. And so there was a congressional compromise which landed us with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, but the military was instrumental in writing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. There were task forces that were appointed by the President and by the Secretary of Defense at the time um, to study these issues. And one was done by the RAND Corporation, which was a think tank created by the military after World War II. And it, it, uh, with, with a $1.3 million budget, they sent 75 interdisciplinary scholars around the world to study this issue, and guess what they found? Sexuality was not germane to military performance. Um, the Joint Chiefs didn't like it. They tried to bury it. They said this was unacceptable. They said it exceeded its mandate um, and only discussed it when it was leaked. Um, the RAND Corporation was one study. Uh, their study was a 500-page study, and it was quite thorough. The other study was done by a panel of generals and admirals that was appointed within the military called the Military Working Group. And for my research, I spoke to several of the, the high-level officials who worked in that group. And they essentially wrote the blueprint to Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so I wanted to share for the, for the first part of uh, these remarks some of what I learned in speaking uh, to some of the people, including the general who initially headed that group but didn't end up um, writing the report. He was transferred somewhere else. Um, but he told me uh, that the policy was, um, first of all, that, that the group didn't really understand what sexual orientation even meant, that they had to define for themselves what they figured was being talked about. Um, they, he said, passion leads and rationale follows, and that it was very, very difficult to get an objective, rational review of this policy because of the emotions that were involved and the prejudices that were involved by the top level officials. And a group staffer told me that he had been tasked to provide research to the uh, flag officers in charge, and they never even considered it, that, um, that the policy was created behind closed doors by people who were never open to the idea of lifting the ban, um, and that their work ended up relying completely on anti-gay stereotypes and on a resistance to outside forces. There was a resentment that Clinton, who had never served, and that civilian uh, political leaders and interest groups were trying to impose on the military uh, a policy that the military didn't want, largely for cultural reasons. Um, a key character in the book and in the history of the policy was Charlie Moskos, who was considered the academic architect of the policy. He was a friend of Sam Nunn's. He was also my professor at Northwestern briefly. And I spoke to him repeatedly throughout the, uh, the years in doing research on this. Um, he said publicly that this was about unit cohesion, that we couldn't lift the ban uh, or we couldn't let gays serve openly when that became sort of the crux of the debate because it would undermine unit cohesion. But he told me privately, screw unit cohesion. And he didn't use the word screw. He used a word I can't use here in polite company. Uh, it is in the book, though. Um, and, and so that is one of the things, you know, since I knew him and since he was a, a renowned sociologist who had been instrumental um, in integrating the military racially. Um, and I, and I, so I wondered for a long time, why, knowing that the evidence said otherwise, why did he say one thing in public and in private, um, acknowledge that this was a moral issue, a religious issue, a cultural issue, um, and, and why did he take his charge as a sociologist and, uh, and use it that way? And so I don't have time to answer that right now, but that's part of what I, what I get into in the book. And I spoke to one other person who was um, the Navy JAG for a while, and he was at the table when the Navy was assigned to do their part to recommend to the larger military working group what the ultimate policy should be. And he said this was, policy was based on nothing. Um, that, that's, that's a quote. It was based on our own prejudices and fears. So I think as we look at the political climate today, and there's uh, obviously going to be a fight, that it's, it, you know, people say, well, what about the showers, what about the military uniform, you know, the brass, what they think, and th that, that, that all these what ifs. Um, it's important to look at the history and to recognize that even uh, 
policymakers who were instrumental in creating this policy 15 years ago have subsequently done, a, you know, many of them, a mea culpa and said, um, this policy was based on nothing. It, it's cultural, it's about morality and religion, and if we want to have that discussion, let's have it honestly. It's not based on evidence about the military. Finally, I just want to uh, raise the question of, is the policy working? Because that too, in the political discussion, is, is sort of how it's often framed. And uh, Senator McCain said, well, I'm told the policy is working, I think it works, let's not touch it, particularly during wartime. So is the policy working? The policy was supposed to make sexuality into a non-issue. It was supposed to preserve talent in the military, um, ensure respect and dignity for gay and lesbian service members and all service members, um, to protect unit cohesion and to protect the talent pool that is increasingly important as we continue to fight two wars overseas. Instead, discharges shot up, harassment shot up, um, the dignity of gay and lesbian service members um, was insulted repeatedly. They continue to this day to be investigated, intimidated, and fired from their jobs, an average of two per day. And we've lost over 12,000 service members uh, who are ready, willing, and able to do the job, uh, particularly uh, Arabic linguists, over 60 Arabic linguists at a time when we have a dire shortage of people who can translate what our enemies are saying. And the government did its own studies and found that about 1,000 of the losses were deemed mission critical. I think uh, you don't have to take my word for this. Every time we go to war, discharges plummet. So the military itself knows what the rest of us know, that uh, you don't have to be straight to shoot straight. Uh, they want to retain talent when unit cohesion is at its most critical. And that's why General John Shalakashvili, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has called for repeal. And I share the news in my book, so you hear, heard it here first, that not just Shalakashvili, but uh, Admiral William Crow, who was Colin Powell's predecessor, Shali was his successor, also told the Palm Center, um, my director there, Aaron Belkin, before, shortly before he died, that he too now favors repeal. Um, I also have a letter from Sam Nunn that hadn't been, hasn't been reported on in which he says, because he came, uh, moved a few steps last year and said the policy should be reviewed, he actually went further in a letter that hasn't been publicized and, and said that there is evidence that the, that the don't ask, don't tell policy is getting in the way of military readiness because of the talent loss. Um, Four-fifths of the public endorses letting gays serve. 50% uh, of junior enlisted personnel now favor it. And 72% of, um, of returning vets from Afghanistan and Iraq are personally comfortable with gays and lesbians. So it's a slightly smaller percentage that actually favors repeal, um, but a majority actually says they're comfortable around gays and lesbians. And that was the whole rationale for the policy, at least publicly, that gay and lesbian service members, you know, their morale would be shot, recruitment would suffer, and so forth. So these are some of the statistics. Uh, some of the stories, too, appear in my book. But again, you don't have to take my word for it. The military itself, based on their actions and based increasingly on what people are saying, high-profile people like Shalakashvili and 100 uh, retired flag officers who signed the document calling for repeal have acknowledged what the research says, which is that gays already serve openly, don't cause problems, and uh, I guess I'm supposed to stop talking now. Is that... <laughs> I was finished we anyway. You can still see me. Uh, well, I, and, and, and I will, I will uh, pause there and, and um, be happy to talk, you know, uh, according to what you say, and, and, and with that frame of sort of knowledge and, and the question of research and, and whether people are willing and able to discuss the facts or just, just their fears. Okay. Uh, I forgot to, before I introduce Dr. Frank also to uh, introduce uh, uh, Congresswoman Tauscher. Uh, so for those of you that don't know her, she's uh, currently serving her seventh term representing California's 10th congressional district. And in the Congress, uh, she's a leader on defense, homeland security, high-tech transportation, and veterans issues. In fact, last week, oh, I'm out of screen, huh? There it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, and for those, I had the privilege la last week at the Fiscal Responsibility Summit that uh, President Obama had uh, sitting next to her talking about a lot of these issues, and she was just uh, terrific. Um, the interesting thing is I did not know until I read her biography in uh, preparation for this, 
uh, that she uh, worked in the private sector for 20 years, 14 of which were on Wall Street. Maybe she can handle another problem for us while she's here. At age 25, she became the first woman and the youngest at the time to hold a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, and she later served as an officer on the American Stock Exchange. So she brings really quite a, 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 ba a background to all of the legislative uh, uh, subjects. All right, with that, let me go back. Let's assume that in 1992, Bob Carey, who challenged uh, Bill Clinton in the primaries, those of you who don't know, Senator Carey was a senator from Nebraska, was a Medal of Honor winner. He also endorsed this policy of repealing the ban. Do you think that if he were the president, the military would have uh, acted the same way you happened to mention because of Clinton's lack of military service? I do think that the, the way the history unfolded played a big part in what ended up happening. Uh, that may go without saying, but it, um, as I touched on briefly, there was a lot of resentment within the military, and you hear again and again when looking at the history that Clinton didn't consult the military brass sufficiently. When I went back and looked, I found that's not really true. Um, Clinton met with Colin Powell um, to talk about this issue instead of talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. It was actually bumped <laughs> off the agenda. Um, so there's another, you know, the damage caused by all the hullabaloo about something like this. Um, just in the first weeks after being elected, it would have been inappropriate, probably not likely to have done so when he was still a candidate. And he met with the whole, you know, the Joint Chiefs um, just after he was elected and then again just after he was inaugurated. Um, and yet there was this idea that, that civilian politicians were trying to impose this change to please the gay lobby and that Clinton himself um, was a draft dodger and so forth. And sure, I think it would have helped tremendously if someone had either been a Republican or a veteran. But, you know, historians don't love to deal in counterfactuals. But I would st say still, and, and I still get reporters asking this today, you know, isn't it possible that a small group of powerful people will stand in the way of this? And I think Yes, it's possible, but the climate has changed so much that the winds are really blowing against that. Okay, let me follow up. And I've done some research, and I've looked at the way the military responded to President Truman's 1948 orders saying to integrate the armed services, uh, <clears throat> the Congress's attempts to open up jobs in the, in the military for women in the so-called non uh, you know, non-traditional areas in, in, in combat. And the military resisted all those. Is it a question of a fear of change? Is it a question you talked about, you know, cultural or, or, or uh, uh, religious issues? What is it that with the military? Is, is it not just this issue, but all issues that involve uh, any type of social change? Let me preface a reply so I don't forget to say it um, by saying that there are certainly people, and we're people in this issue as with the issues Larry mentioned, um, who had genuine well-motivated concerns about what would happen if you change the culture of the military too quickly and could you have you know a mass exodus and the people I spoke to and I was grateful <coughs> that they spoke to me and spoke candidly said you know ultimately they said this was about fear and that's not a good reason and it was about prejudice and it was about moral and religious concerns but it was also um, genuine they thought the sky might fall um, so I think there are some people who genuinely think that and I don't want to just call everyone who opposed change um, a bigot but there were many, many bigots, and, 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 and not just bigots, people who had a certain understanding of the way uh, America should look and the way the military should look, and it became a testing ground for who, uh, who was a real American. And so I go into great detail in the book um, about the, the social conservatives and religious conservatives in particular who used this as, you know, as, as the central stage for that battle. Um, and it, you know, some of the, the opposition was even more... Um, more vituperative than, uh, th than in the issues that you've mentioned, although it's not a competition. Um, it's certainly about a cultural sense of who we are as Americans. And in a sense, I don't begrudge people for saying, you know, that a warrior is, is this kind of person. And if you let that kind of person be a warrior, I don't feel like a warrior as much. Now, I think those people have to get with the program and understand that the meaning changes. But yes, this is about the cultural meaning of who we are and of, who, of what a soldier is. After the creation of the volunteer military in 1973, the military became less representative of American society and became much more socially conservative, and, uh, and, and we see that in terms of their stand on a lot of issues. 
Do you think that that played a role, that in fact, uh, that the military itself had changed, say, in the 20 years before President Clinton had come in, as opposed to the to the draft military, which rep was a much wider representation? I do think that's a big part of it. And I think that's part of what allowed this issue and issues like it, and military cultural issues in general, to become um, you know, ground zero for this this culture war battle. And it's one of the things that drew me to the issue, but then uh, I also saw increasingly that it's a national security issue. But that civil military gap that you're referencing is um, is crucial. And, and you know, there's, I go into some detail about that gap and how that's harmful for both the military and civilian society. They need each other. And the military did, um, it's something that military insiders are concerned about. Let me ask one final question before I turn it over to the audience. When I testified in 1993 in support of Clinton's uh, policy to drop the, the ban on gays in the military, I and cited a lot of the evidence, some of which you've talked about, the rejoinder from other people, members of the, the Senate was, well, our military is different than all those other militaries because basically even back then all of our NATO allies, Israel, for example, had allowed gays to serve openly. We're an expeditionary. We're the closest you have is the British. Uh, do they have submarines like uh, we do? And you may remember the thing with Nunn and Warner calling around the submarine, you know, during the, uh, that, that, that period. The British policy, they kept the same policy, but then the Euro European Court of Human Rights told them to drop it, and now they feel comfortable with it. So do you think that that's kind of, in terms of research, is the straw that breaks the camel's back if we're looking at this as a research? I think that Britain is a very good model. I mean, I chuckle sometimes when I hear people say, oh, America is, the, uh, is different from everyone. It's true. America is different from other countries uh, culturally, and our military is the strongest and most po powerful, and it's an important, very important institution. But are they really saying that keeping the US military number one relies on telling this small, relatively small, or 65,000 estimated, but a pocket of gay and lesbian service members that they have to lie to their peers. I mean, yes, we don't take all of our lessons from other countries, but we do have an Office of Foreign Studies uh, where we do take lessons from other countries, and, the, and we serve in, in foxholes, such as they are with Britain. Um, and Britain, like America, resisted this for cultural reasons, and polls there said, just as they do here, were worse. They said, they said, you know, majorities of people will leave if you lift this ban. That's a poll in that case is a way of letting people register their moral disapproval, but when the ban was lifted, nothing like that happened. And in fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't the British military now build housing for gay couples on their bases and allow them to serve on submarines? That's something they're struggling with, but they do have, uh, I, I don't mean struggling in a bad way, that's something that they're dealing with. Um, they do have uh, recruiters at Gay Pride and people in uniform, and it's just, you know, again and again, it's a non-issue. It's, it's sometimes hard to get the media interested in what goes on because you say, oh, we have a big study. That's what the Palm Center does. You know, we studied Britain. Um, nothing happened. We lifted the ban and nothing happened. So it's, it's, there's not much there. All right, we're now open for the floor. We get the press to ask the, anybody, members of the press, have a question you'd like to ask? Remember the... <clears throat> Thanks. Yes. By yourself, please. Sure. Frank Davies with the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, I, I've got a, a lot of questions, but let me just stick to kind of the, the general political one and, and to both of you, but to, especially to Mr. Korb, since you've been through this in several different administrations, uh, given the fact that the new president does not have military experience and obviously has an enormous agenda, does he expend political capital in pushing this issue, which was a campaign pledge that he would change this policy. Uh, and you've advised the Obama team. How, how do you see them handling this in the next year or so? <clears throat> yeah, terrific question. Let me make two points. The issue of military service, I think we've gotten over the Vietnam era because uh, President Obama, you know, wasn't, was born, you know, when the, the war was, was ending and, you know, he obviously came of age before there was a, a draft. I think President Clinton's problem was the way he handled uh, the, the, the draft. So I don't think that that's as, as, as crucial, though I do agree with uh, what Dr. Frank said here in terms of, you know, if you had a Medal of Honor winner uh, like, uh, you know, Bob Carey, uh, that, that certainly would add to it. The other is, I've been impressed so far that despite the problems that he has in dealing with it, 
he's not willing, you know, he takes on his issues. I mean, if you look at what he said about getting out of Iraq. Your mic's off. My mic went off you, again. You want to speak to my mic? Off again. <laughs> well, I speak pretty loud. Can you there hear you me? Okay. Uh, basically that he is, you know, willing to carry out his campaign, uh, you know, campaign uh, promises. Uh, and maybe I think when uh, Congresswoman uh, Tausha gets here, you can ask her, you know, legislatively how to do that. But I've been very impressed. He's gone right, you know, down and said, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And he's, uh, he's, he's done it. And I, but I got to agree with you. I mean, his agenda is certainly full. If you look at last week, the three major policy, you know, pronouncements that he came out with was an awful lot in, uh, in, in, in one week. Yeah. The way I would answer that question is that, the same way I looked at the ban, the, the whole policy. What are the costs and benefits of taking action or of inaction? I think Obama is being understandably cautious because Clinton was scarred by this <coughs> issue and because there are bigger priorities, frankly, than gays in the military. Um, I think everyone understands that. But there are costs to delaying politically and, um, and otherwise. I mean, a lot of the, the hullabaloo that opponents of change screamed about in the 90s was this is taking away our focus, this is undermining morale, just talking about it. Well, if they hadn't put up such a fuss about something so small, then it wouldn't have. And, and, and what Obama may encounter is that in trying to avoid Clinton's mistakes, he ironically repeats them because the delay is arguably what got Clinton into trouble in the first place. He allowed a study period, and study is often code in Washington for delay and defeat, and that's what happened. It allowed the opposition to rally and fester and, and derail his program. So I think that's yeah. a real risk. And the other thing is, that, let me mention this, uh, President Obama is committed to expanding the size of the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, the Army has had a very difficult time in attracting the, the number of quality recruits that they'd like. And obviously, if you drop the ban, you enlarge the pool from which you can recruit as well as uh, the number of people who, uh, who get out. Remember last year the Army to meet its quota had to take in 800 people with felony convictions. And if you saw the op-ed in the New York Times, I guess it was about two weeks ago, by uh, uh, Bing West's son. Bing and I served together uh, in, the, uh, in the Reagan administration. His son is a, a Marine reservist that basically made that point. You're throwing out gays and taking in felons. That doesn't make a great deal of sense. But he gave a great description of, you know, what life was like, you know, over there in Iraq, and that was the last thing people were worried about. Okay, any other press questions? If not, open up for the general audience. Yes, sir, right up here. And if you'd identify yourself, we'd appreciate it. Uh, I'm John Craig. I'm a clinical social worker at Nova Hospital and uh, have worked with uh, gay married men and bisexual men, and a lot of them very much uh, closeted. Uh, some in the military. But I just wondered if you might address the issue that there's a pretty old idea that uh, homoerotic, homoerotic attractions can exist in most people, at least in different phases of their uh, lives, perhaps mostly in, in young men at times. Um, so you've got Alfred Kinsey with his Kinsey scale and uh, Sigmund Freud's ideas. And I'm just wondering, you also mentioned the definition of a warrior. If you look back in the ancient world, Warriors had a lot of homoerotic uh, interactions. And I'm just wondering if that issue came up in your research or uh, ever. I'm glad you asked that question. I addressed this issue head on. It's the second half of Chapter 5. I like to give cheat, cheating uh, tips so you don't have to read the whole thing, but do buy it. Um, and the reason I bring it up is because it came up in Congress, actually. It came up uh, when Charlie Moskos, whom I mentioned, and a couple other sociologists acknowledged that there was research from Hitler's uh, Wehrmacht army around World War II that, sh that suggested that the homoerotic bonds of military culture um, are, are an important aspect of bonding. Uh, and that the reason, again, that this policy was about acknowledging gay identity rather than whether gays could serve, which everyone knew they always had, was that that's when it became a problem, when you say it, when you acknowledge it so that when you share a sleeping bag for warmth or you, you have a, a, a pat on the, what do I say here, back, bum, we'd say in England, uh, that can be a part of male bonding or a part of, you know, unicohesion or military necessity is actually about warmth. Um, if there's no gays in the midst, that's just what it is. Once you acknowledge that there are gays in the barracks, then suddenly it raises these clouds of suspicion. 
course, it's circular reasoning, because if the culture and the military didn't go out, so out of its way to say that being gay is the worst thing in the world, then it would be much less of a concern that, oh my god, they're going to think I'm gay. So it, it was fascinating to me that this came up um, in, on the congressional floor during Sam Nunn's hearings. And, and I do address that a little bit. And I think that uh, you know, the idea is not to suggest everyone in the military is gay. That's, that's not the point. The point is that um, the military is a homosocial environment, in some ways homoerotic. It is um, about, as Homer Simpson once said, people who uh, enjoy the company of other men. Um, Homer said, who doesn't? <laughs> that was the joke. But th that's an important part of what's going on here underneath, I think. OK, next uh, question. Yes, sir, over there. I'm Jim Lowe, and I wrote a book called Lies. My teacher told me about how we mislearn American history. Uh, I'm an independent scholar. And in a former life, I worked at an Explorer Scout summer camp uh, for five years. We had an assistant director who was not only gay, but was um, a predator. And uh, this taught me that 16, 17, 18, 19 year old males, and perhaps females as well, but I don't know about that, w were um, ill equipped to handle uh, such predation. Uh, they wondered if, they didn't want to talk about it, they wondered if uh, it signaled somehow that they were gay even though they didn't know they were gay, and some of them weren't gay, uh, most of them probably, and many of them responded by uh, never wanting to be around again and by drop, you know, they would have dropped out of the, the camp staff had the man himself not, through a long chain of circumstances, gotten fired. Uh, the Boy Scouts are not nearly as um, hierarchical, actually, as the military. Uh, how, do you, how do militaries, and how will our military, deal with the up-downness of military command, especially when the guy right over you is gay and m perhaps makes an inappropriate um, move in that regard? Well, this is partly a product of the closet, and the more you drive um, this issue underground and require people to repress and pretend and lie, uh, the less that the, the more it's going to happen, and the less you can regulate it. Of course, um, you know there are old stereotypes that gays are more likely to be sexual predators than others, and those aren't true. And the research shows again and again not only that that's not true, uh, but that 24 foreign militaries uh, have lifted their bans and have had no trouble. It's not to say there isn't. Uh, uh, scattered problem here or there, but let me tell you, the problems are much, much broader when it comes to men and women um, who are now you know, serving in the military together, and they weren't uh, once upon a time. So I think there's a little bit of, uh, of this idea that, uh, that is left over from these stereotypes that gays are sexual predators. Um, but I, you know, I appreciate the question, because part of the question is, well, we separate men and women in most cases, although not all cases, especially over, you know, in hostile terrain, it's not always possible. Um, and yet we don't separate people of the same sex. That's you know, not feasible. So how do you deal with it? Well, you deal with it, uh, first of all, by not driving it underground. Second of all, through the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Third of all, by having a culture that's able, that encourages talking about this rather than um, you know, letting it fester in the darkness, which is, which is part of the problem. And, and fourthly, you don't, you, know, you don't assume, stereotypically, that, that gays are going to cause this problem any more than, than straight men who are, um, I think, a bigger problem in the military. And doesn't the armed forces have the Uniform Code of Military Justice to deal with this? Right. Yes. And, you know, and, and that's 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 the, the method that you would use. Is not you know not always comforting to everyone because, it, as the gentleman said, there's a concern sometimes that uh, there's shame and people wouldn't be able to talk about it. So that's a big part of it. And also, I think culturally, um, encouraging people to not be underground is a big part of it. Okay. Next uh, question here. Thanks. Uh, Bob Rohr with the Bay Area Reporter. Uh, a couple of years ago, I said it's now, the, uh, there was a proposal to reform the UCMJs, particularly in, with regard to um, sexual activities, um, you know, both gay and straight. Uh, has anything happened with that? Is there any possibility of it happening in the short term or the intermediate term? Well, it, when, it, <clears throat> when you talk about the Uniform Code of Military Justice, if you read that literally, 90% of the people uh, in the armed services would be uh, in trouble because it prescribes all kinds of other activities uh, uh, that people uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be doing that uh, I think most, I can say, <clears throat> 
most married couples do. And uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. I've never seen anything like anything like that. I agree with you. I think it should be, but it's one of those things that it, you know you open it up and you'll have all kinds of uh, of uh, uh, you know I think other other concerns. And go back to your colleague's question about in terms of you got a lot on your plate. That would add you know uh, even more. I, well, I agree with that. I would I would also just to add to that that UCMJ, which is military law, does. Um, doesn't single out homosexuals. It it bans sodomy, and it's not that that is not something um, that people should not be doing, so long as it's not getting in the way of. I mean, it, what does my opinion matter? But I I think the UCMJ needs to be reformed, but it doesn't need to be reformed to lift this policy. And the Military Readiness Enhancement Act, um, that that's uh, that's the most likely you know law to replace the the, the discriminatory law, um, doesn't touch that, and it says it will be replaced with a a law of equal treatment, and I think that's the focus right now. Okay. Question? Thank you. Um, Yuta Tobias, American Psychological Association. At the APA, we're a big fan of the Palm Center and of your research, of course. Um, and leading on from the, the previous but one question, um, since this is an identity-based problem and, a, and an emotional problem, um, problem <laughs> issue, um, would you recommend that in our advocacy we focus not necessarily on the scientific arguments, on the unit versus task cohesion, but actually on the cost-benefit analysis and the things that are a little bit easier to digest but perhaps and that are less um, controversial in that sense? Let me add to that if I can, and this was brought up in Owen West's article. Is this a civil rights issue or is it a military readiness issue? Is it both? Do, how, do, which is the best thing to mm -hmm. emphasize? I have a lot to say and a little to say on that, and so I'll try to strike a balance. I mean, as a scholar, I'm interested in all avenues um, and not exclusively uh, in figuring out, you know, the, the practical message, although that's certainly a part of what I do because I want the message to get out there and I care about it. Um, there's a history of the history, which is that this started out, um, at least in the 90s, as a civil rights and a gay rights issue, that's the way it was cast. And I think ultimately we learned that that was a mistake because shifting the frame to one of military necessity and then the, the creation of the so-called unit cohesion rationale, which I debunk in the book and which some of the, the military officials I spoke to acknowledge was a fiction, um, that's what won the battle for those who opposed getting rid of the ban entirely. And so um, since America became a nation at, w at war, using that same frame, even though it wasn't really what it was about, has actually helped those who favor repealing the ban because this became a national security issue. It became an issue of losing, um, you know, losing talent we couldn't afford to lose um, and forcing gay and lesbian service members to fight with one hand tied behind their backs. I mean, another thing I look at are the hidden costs of the policy, and this does uh, fit under the rubric you're suggesting we use, which is that I found in my research that the policy um, makes it difficult for gay and lesbian service members to access the support services that are considered critical for everyone else for readiness and morale, especially when we're at war. They can't speak to their, their physicians um, openly, their psychologists, their, their clergy, their chaplains. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of practical ways to make those costs and benefits clear, and I do think that's wise. And at the same time, you know, in addressing one of the other questions, um, I have a sort of broader interest, which is, that this is a cultural phenomenon that's very deep and that I'm interested in sort of nudging in a certain direction toward openness. If, if you look at the history of African Americans and women, it ended up basically military necessity. People forget that President Truman issued the order to integrate the armed forces in 1948, and the, they just refused to do it. And it was only the Korean War in which they had to do it, and then they realized that it wasn't causing all of the problems. In fact, when I did some research on this, I can show you statements by people in, the, in 1948. You just changed the African Americans to substitute gays. It's just exactly the same, uh, the same uh, consequences that they were predicting. And the same way with women in the military. The uh, military, basically, when they went to a volunteer military, they couldn't ignore 50 some odd percent of the population if they wanted to meet their quotas. And to tell you how much it's changed, a couple of, about two years ago, 
uh, the House Armed Services Committee complained to the Army that they were violating their own policies on women in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, which they were. And so they put this provision in the bill. The Army told them, get it out. We, can't, we have no choice, you know, see, given the circumstances. So I think that, you know, when you, you, the military necessity has the one that has prevailed in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in the, long, in the long run. And that was the, the part that uh, Owen West made in his uh, New York Times uh, op-ed. All right, next question. Yes, Malin. Hi, I'm Rachel Lazar. I work at a think tank here, a progressive think tank called Third Way. And uh, thanks for your comments and your insightful book, and I look forward to reading it. I wanted to share with you something that we found recently in three polls that we did, one national, one in California, one in Arkansas. The polls were mostly on same-sex relationship recognition, but the insights, I think, apply here as well. We were looking at a particular group that we call the movable middle. And we were trying to understand them and where their resistance is on gay and lesbian issues. And something that we found across the board is that they are believers in traditional institutions and societal institutions. 46% of them go to church once a week or more. 65% of them are married, things like that. And what we discovered is, uh, on the same-sex relationship context, but I think here, too, you have to win the join versus change argument. So you need to convince them that what gays and lesbians are trying to do are join these institutions and not change them. And here, as, as is the case in many issues, it's complicated by the fact that we have a lot of data that shows aspects of how permitting gays and lesbians to serve openly does actually strengthen the institution. But strengthen is a form of change. And it's just something that I, I wanted to highlight on the topic of framing, because I think it's a little bit in tension with what's actually very effective in moving the middle, which is that gays and lesbians want to join this institution, the military, and serve as patriotic, patriotic valor types of ambitions. Yeah. That's a great point, and I'm a big fan of the third way, too. I've looked at some of your, your material, and it's great stuff. Um, I've also written I'm not just a one-trick pony about the marriage issue, and I have framed it that way. And I have said, uh, I have, I, I've tried to be candid and say, look, this would be a change, but it's a change you can live with. To 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 look at marriage as um, including and also encompassing couples of the same sex, um, and that we you know we need to be candid about that because otherwise there's just that fear lurking right this is going to change it's going to go so far the slippery slope it's going to fall down the slope um, and so I think that's important with respect to this issue um, one way of of navigating that point is that this is an issue that's always been about parallel universes it's been this this fiction that people told themselves that gays couldn't possibly serve openly in the military with success and then there's been the reality on the ground, which is that gays have always served and not just served in the closet. People still say, well, I know they've always served, but they've done it discreetly. No, we have evidence of thousands of gays serving openly. And most people just don't care, even though polls, when you ask everyone, and it depends on how you ask it, will often reflect, well, we don't, you know, we don't like this. So the way it gets back to your, your point is to say, this is really not about change. This is about the law and our rhetoric catching up with reality. Um, and I, but I think it's a great point that you know this is this is about gays and lesbians wanting to join institutions. They might be slightly altered by that, but for the better. And in fact, they're already that way. Let's just be honest. Okay. Next question. Okay, in the back there. <clears throat> My name is Sarah Wilson, and I'm a senior at Kent State University. And I just had a question about advocacy, basing on her question. Um, with President Clinton and his um, support uh, to get rid of the ban against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and then his signing of the Defense of Marriage Act, and I think it was 1994, and President Obama's openness about being willing to confront the issue and then um, some upset in the gay community about him choosing Rick Warren to kind of bless the administration as the first, um, first step in the administration. Is there anyone that's really left that can, that's left to advocate for this for this group of people that can actually do it without having to worry about their political future or their military future? Is there anyone left that can just go and do it? And is there anyone that's like doing it today? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, my advice would be for the moment that if you support Obama and what he's doing generally, um, 
hold the faith for a while. It's very, you know, if I were Obama, if I were advising him, as much as I care about this issue because it's my work for the moment, I understand what he's up against. And, um, you know, the Rick Warren thing was disappointing. Um, there will be disappointments. But I think Obama's heart is in the right place, as was Clinton's. And that if Obama approaches this issue, issue with the confidence that the research is on his side, um, and with the help of people who are interested in advocating for change, that it still may happen. Um, you know, I, I, so I don't know how literal your question was. I mean, there's plenty of people still out there, and there's a new generation of politicians every generation. Um, and as, as, I guess I, I see it as our, my responsibility, our responsibility to, um, I mean, politicians have constraints. It's politics. Uh, I get disappointed by them sometimes and wish they would lead. Um, but I'm a little bit more focused on, on nudging the culture. And when we nudge the culture in, uh, adequately, uh, the politicians will fall into line. <clears throat> okay, we have time for, I see Congresswoman Tausch is here. Does anybody have a final question before we turn the podium uh, over? Okay, yes, sir. Uh, Bob Miller with a nonprofit, Hope for America. Uh, you, you mentioned that the moral issue is probably the, the buried issue, actually, that underlies all of the uh, invalid ones. What, what do you sense to be the moral principle at stake? And uh, is it invalid? Is it irrelevant? Uh, would you just say a few words about that? Maybe you could also comment on General Pace. Right. I think, who was the right. chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Right. That reminds me, that's what I was starting to say when I promised not to go on too long about the history, is <laughs> that the, the issue was first one of equality, and it was a moral issue. You know, this is, a, this is fair and right. Um, then it became an issue of national security for a couple of reasons. Um, and when General Pace um, apparently didn't get the memo that he was supposed to talk about it in terms of national security, and he said, whoops, I think this is immoral, um, you know, he... he he was roundly cried down, criticized, didn't remain joint, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for long. So people say that was part of the reason. Um, and, and so, it, it, in a sense, though, ironically, you know, he was back on um, on topic because because the, and depending on who you ask, I mean, the moral issue for a lot of social conservatives and religious people is they think homosexuality is a sin. And, Personally, I don't, and I, and I try to talk about morality in practical terms, which doesn't always satisfy people who see morality as simply, um, this is what I was taught, and therefore this is right and that is wrong. And they're not interested in explaining it in a civil dialogue. They're interested in simply saying this is what their book says. Um, you know, it's important to figure out ways to engage people who believe that, but it's equally important to say this is a moral issue uh, about fairness, too, and about equal rights. And the research has taken care of the other stuff, um, and as Representative Tauscher said last week, uh, now is always the time to right a wrong. And so I think, you know, it, you don't want to ignore the moral concerns of people on the other side of the fence, but they are slightly different. They're not, they're, they're not talking to each other um, in exactly the right way. The right way. Um, but the moral issue on my side is that this is about equal treatment before the law, and there's no reason that we shouldn't have that. That's a terrific segue into Congresswoman Tauscher, and I mentioned in reading your biography before you came, not only can you help us on this issue, but maybe you can straighten out the mess on Wall Street for us, too. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, yeah, I used to always ex tell everybody that I had a seat on the New York Stock Exchange when I was 25, and then I was an investment banker for 14 years, and now I realize that I'm an antique because there aren't any investment bankers anymore. <laughs> but uh, clearly I have a thing for male-dominated institutions, having spent so much time on Wall Street and <laughs> now the other place. But I really want to thank uh, my friends here at the Center for American Progress. We try to... Uh, uh, whenever we, we're trying to do something uh, that we think is impactful or important, we try to come here to do it. So we, of course, want to thank Winnie and John Podesta. And I want to thank my great friend, Larry Korb. Um, and I want to thank the CAPS media team for, for working with us. I see my friend uh, and partner, Aubrey Sarvis, here, and David Stacy. I think I saw here. And uh, friends from HRC are being uh, very, very supportive uh, and uh, I want to thank them for their tireless ab advocacy for these issues. Um, because of SLDN's hard work and uh, HRC's hard work, 
I am introducing my bill to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell with almost 112 co-sponsors this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have to actually wait till tomorrow because we're not going to be in session tonight because of the uh, snow. Uh, but it's an honor to be here. I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about um, why I've decided to do it here and why it's important um, that we do this um, at this time. You know, CAP's work on this issue and others has been crucial in helping progressives develop a winning message and, and to get out there with confidence on, on things that haven't been talked about in quite a while. Um, your work here at CAP has been critical in 2008 and will remain important as we try to implement progressive change in 2009 and beyond. So I want to thank you, Winnie and John, for all your hard work. Let me start by saying what is, I think, obvious. I am enormously proud of our nation's military and their men and women who volunteer to leave the safety and comfort of their home, put themselves at risk, leave their jobs, leave their, their children, and uh, serve uh, our country under very, very difficult circumstances. No one that's in the military now is confused about the fact that they're going to have to take multiple tours to Iraq, Afghanistan, other places. Um, it's, it's a dangerous job. It is a, it is a time when we have an overstretched military. Uh, and I'm honored to represent a special place in California where Travis Air Force Base is located in my district. And I'm also honored to serve on the House Armed Services Committee where I am the chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. While the military's primary job is to fight wars, the military has also been a force for social change and upward mobility. Desegregation in the Army paved the way for racial integration that we see in the military today. By breaking down artificial barriers, women have refined, refined their roles in the military, corporate America, and Congress. And my little time on Wall Street when I was a small child, I can tell you I know that firsthand. We have a military that is truly the finest in the world, but we must tear down one final last barrier. We need to end the don't ask, don't tell policy. To understand why we need to move forward, it's important to understand where we stand and where we have been truly at the center of injustice. Before World War II, the military had no official policy barring gay men and women from serving in the military. That does not mean that there was not any discrimination, it just means it wasn't official policy. In 1940, the War Department defined homosexual orientation as a psych psychiatric handicap and a disqualifying deviation. A soldier could get up to 12 years of military confinement and a dishonorable discharge. Forty years later, DOD policy stated that, and I quote, homosexuality was never compatible with military service, close quote. That rule was in effect until 1993, when President Clinton half fulfilled his promise to allow all people, quote, who wish to do so to serve their country, close quote, and that the emphasis should be always on people's conduct, not their status. Well, that didn't exactly happen. Since its exception, Don't Ask, Don't Tell has discharged 12,500 qualified servicemen and women, many of whom possessed critical skills. The first 10 years of this policy alone cost the Department of Defense at least $363 million. And today, there are more than 1 million gay and lesbian veterans and at least 65,000 gay men and women who serve in fear of being harassed, embarrassed, and administratively discharged for simply being who they are. The Department of Defense needs to review this policy and the selective manner in which it has been implemented. Before the Korean War, the average number of discharges was 1,100 per year. During the war, this number dropped to 483 per year. The same thing happened during the Vietnam War. The average number of discharges dropped from 1,650 a year to 461 in 1970. More recently, the Department of Defense, Defense has invoked a poli policy called stop loss. The Defense Department relaxed a wide array of standards in order to recruit significantly more men and women and discharge fewer of them. The bottom line is that the Department has been running a system that allows it to ignore its own policy and then invoke it when it needs to. That is unacceptable. And together, we will change this. It is no longer a question of if we will change this law. It is just a question of when. Many have asked why now. I have always said that there is no right time to right a wrong, that there is always time to right a wrong. We all have seen a sea change that reinforces this belief. When Don't Ask, Don't Tell became a policy, Colin Powell was one of the biggest champions. Now Secretary Powell and others like him 
and including people like Senator Sam Nunn. 28 retired generals and admirals have called on the Pentagon to repeal the ban. More importantly, recent polling show that more than 70 percent of the troops who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan support lifting the ban. Quite simply, this is 2009, not 1993. So today, I am introducing the Military Readiness Enhancement Act. This bill will once and for all end the discriminatory practices of the Department of Defense and men and women who have been administratively discharged would be allowed to have the opportunity to serve again if they want. I want to address tr critics who might argue that overturning the law that will lead to a lack of unit cohesion and an increase in assaults. First, in countries like in England, Canada, Australia, and, is and Israel, nothing of this sort has happened. Even though public opinion sh polls show that lifting the ban in England would be unpopular, the military described it as a non-event. Second, I know that our men and women in uniform will comply with the laws we set forth if those laws are morally sound, clearly understood, and executed with purpose by everyone from the President as Commander-in-Chief to our lieutenants and non-commissioned officers. There is no evidence to support a continued ban on open service and every reason to allow lesbian and gay Americans to serve our country. Our troops are already serving with gay and lesbian colleagues without incident and in are increasingly comfortable doing so. As someone who is concerned about building the strongest military possible and someone entrusted with promoting the best interests of the armed forces, I believe it is important to allow the Pentagon to recruit among the best and brightest Americans, regardless of sexual orientation. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to come here today, and I look forward to working with all of you to make sure that this legislation becomes law. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And once again, um, Dr. Frank, thank you so much for your very, very, very clear, cogent work. Appreciate you it. are a great ally for us to have out there in the real world, and I very much appreciate it. As are you. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for questions. Congressman, do you want to sit down or take I'm questions fine. standing up? Yeah, okay, fine. I'm fine, thank you. Uh, the floor is open for questions for uh, Congresswoman Tauscher. Yes, sir. Will O'Brien, Metro Weekly. First, I'm just curious to know what you're hearing from your constituents directly about this, either pro or con, and then relative to 93, how heated a fight are you expecting in Congress on this? Right. Well, um, well, Will, I come from... Um, a part of the country where I'm blessed to work for the smartest people in the country. Uh, not because they've elected me seven times, although that is a nice coincidence, but um, <laughs> it's just the truth. Uh, when I see people, I was home this weekend, when I see people in the Safeway or um, at an event, um, probably, you know, right now, six out of ten people talk to me about the economy, mortgage foreclosures. It, it is very much of a domestic agenda. Um, but maybe one out of ten people comes up to me. Um, more often, it's a mom that says to me, um, my son or daughter is gay or lesbian, and I'm so proud of what you're doing. Um, I think that many people, my constituents and many people generally, um, don't understand why this law still exists. They consider it to be um, a dinosaur of civil rights legislation, and they think that something should have been done a while ago. Um, I think that we have, with the introduction of the legislation, the opportunity to do what we do best here in Washington, which is to inform people, to educate people, and to build the political will necessary to get things done. Uh, so last year, um, my great friend Susan Davis, who's the chairman of the Personnel Subcommittee, had the first hearing on Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 15 years. Uh, so there's an information gap. And uh, for people that either haven't thought about it or don't want to think about it, and there's a lot of those, um, it's important that we do what we're supposed to do here in Washington. So we will have hearings. Uh, we will have um, uh, different opportunities for people to understand how things have changed in the, in the, in the time. Um, but there are some facts that are very clear. Certainly Colin Powell, who was the physical embodiment of the opposition in 1993, um, has um, come to our side and said that he believes that this law should be changed. Um, we have a number of flag officers, most of them retired, who have said that they believe it should be changed. We have allies, 26 countries, and some of our biggest allies in the world all have this policy with for no, no repercussions. And the American people now, well over 75% of them. In 1993, it was 50-50. It's now 75% of the American people believe that this is the wrong policy and it should be changed. So what you have to do is knit all of this together um, in a way where you can get um, 218 votes in the House and 
60 votes in the Senate, and uh, we have the one thing that we've needed for a long time, which is a president that will sign it. If you remember back during the debates when we had a number of candidates, there was one time and there were six or seven of them on the stage and the press asked the question and every hand went up immediately, would you sign the repeal, don't ask, don't tell, and they all said yes. So we, we finally have um, the alchemy has come together for us where we have all the pieces that we need and now we have to galvanize the will of the American people through their representation here in Washington, House of Members, Senate Members, and we have to pass it and get it to the President and the President as Commander-in-Chief will make the decision when that happens. Okay. Next question, yes. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Stephen from uh, Senator Comrade's office and um, before you um, arrive we talked very briefly about like um, framing the issue and um, issues of civil rights against military effect um, readiness. Um, I was wondering in light of what seemed like pretty compelling arguments um, uh, for in terms of military readiness, how, what do you, what, how do you think the opposition will frame their arguments and do you think that those cultural issues will come to the fore or do you think they'll keep trying to talk about cohesion and so on? Well, um, you know, sometimes you're blessed by the opponent that you have in a debate and I think that um, I think that our opponents frankly have stale old arguments that were perhaps politically compelling in 1993 um, and caused this to be a half measure called, called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, not a full repeal. Um, but I think that what we have are the facts on our side and I think that this is, there is a duality in this debate. I, I tend, as Dr. Frank mentioned, I tend to talk about this as a civil rights debate. Um, I think that it is much more compelling for average Americans, considering the fact that the military <coughs> right now, as Larry knows, is based uh, based on um, mostly it's a family business. Uh, lots of people in the military are, especially those that are in active duty now and make it a career, their father, their grandfather, they have family business. and. So for them, it's, a, it's an argument also of unit cohesion and other things because the constituency in this debate is not just the American people, although they have the biggest megaphone and the biggest voice and the biggest vote. There are other constituencies that we want to satisfy. And in satisfying them, that does not mean that we bend over backwards or we retreat. It means that we keep the information in, in a way that they can, um, that can be presented to them that is about them. So it's not just just the American people, it's, it's retired um, military veterans, it's military families, um, it's people that are supporters of the military. So we have a number of ways um, of sending the message out, but I believe that it's primarily a civil rights debate. Um, we, we can expect that our opponents are going to um, create, try to fear monger about unit cohesion and things like that, which frankly, that's fine. Ameri the American people don't understand what that means. You know, for them, it's basic. That's a theoretical. I'm happy to talk to them about the reality, uh, and I think that we'll get pretty far answering the, the questions that they bring forward, which I think are fear mongering, and I think that we can make the debate about civil rights, which is what it really is. Next question. Let me raise a question, and before sure. you come in, somebody raise the question. Given all of the, and you refer to it in terms of, you know, the right time. Given all of the other issues on the nation's plate, uh, are you worried that this will get lost or that people can't give it the attention that they, that they should? Well, that's why it's an American woman introducing it, because we can multitask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a great question. Look, you know, we've all got our hair on fire about seven or eight things at once. Um, you know, I think that clearly what's important here, and that's why I try to structure the debate to be not, not if this is going to happen, it's going to happen. And, um, and actually, actually when is not even an issue as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the question I think really is how. And um, because there has been so much personal damage done, because there has been um, such a denigration of people and, um, and who they are, um, I'd like to add a little class to the debate, and I think class always works. My mother tells me it does, and I believe her. And I think we're going to have a, we're going to try to keep it up here. We're going to try to keep it a debate about the issues, and we're not going to um, get pushed around by 
um, the the bigots on their side, the uh, the opponents that that want to you know make this a fear mongering debate. So so once we've settled on that, the question of how is important, and the question of how is a political question, and the question of how um, and when. Um, I believe really um, needs to be driven by what the commander in chief's uh, decisions are uh, about what the priorities are going forward. Um, clearly, we're going to have troops coming out of Iraq. I think the president's message on that um, this last weekend is, is very, very good. And I think he's not only keeping his promise, but he's doing it in the kind of responsible way that the American people want. Um, we're going to be putting more troops into Afghanistan. Uh, that region is. I was there in September. Uh, Pakistan is the most dangerous place in the world, and Afghanistan is, of course, suffering from uh, all of that. So the question of how and when is is really it, and I think it's got a lot to do with what we can do to make the case. So having hearings and doing the things that we're supposed to do in regular order are important, building the case and building the momentum. But in the end, I believe working with President Obama and Speaker Pelosi and Harry Reid we can then make a decision on when we bring this to a vote. And um, you know, if we get to 218 in the House, we may take it first um, and then let the Senate act. But I think that, once again, it's about building political momentum. It's about making our case. It's about disabling the arguments that our uh, friends on the other side are going to make and put them where they belong. And then have it ready for a queuing time when somebody in our leadership says, now's the time to go. This is what the White House says we should be doing. So I think I'm very confident. Um, now, if you ask me when it's going to happen, I will tell you that we need time. We need time to build a political debate in the House and get the number of sponsors that we need. We have a number of people in the Senate that I think we would like to have as a sponsor. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, so you know, there's a lot of time for us to move forward, but um, I think that we should be confident that it is going to happen. And I think that we should be confident that we're not only going to win the debate, but we're going to win the tenor of the debate, too, which is always good for us. Dr. Frank has a question for yes. us. Uh, as someone who has studied this issue a lot, it's um, hard for me to imagine that more research would be needed as an important part of this. Um, but you know, certainly hearings is a form of research. I'm just wondering, some people in the White House have suggested uh, that a study commission be appointed. And I'm wondering if you think that's an important way to go as part of building the case. Well, what I've suggested is that we do three things, um, and I've su I made this suggestion last year, and I, and I think the White House does believe it's the right thing to do. Um, I think that at, you know, as we have the, we're building, you know, we have time to build the political consensus in the House and the Senate. There are things that we can be doing in parallel that will greatly add our ability to make the arguments to the different constituencies. Um, I do think that the president could um, empower the chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, to respond to a question. Now, considering that this is the law, the military leadership can only respond to a certain kind of question. The president could hypothetically ask Admiral Mullen, how would you implement um, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell? And I also think that it would be a very good idea to have an independent commission headed by somebody like, oh, I don't know, Colin Powell, um, where you had a number of people that um, had, you know, flag officers that had served and non-commissioned officers that had served, uh, where you gave them six months, eight months maybe, um, to look at the, uh, the different intricacies of the different services um, specific to um, living arrangements, housing, you know, things that are going to be um, potential issues where they have to, you know, where we have to ask an answer. And I think that that could come, you know, toward the end of this year. And I think those two things specifically could lay the groundwork for um, the kind of information that we also want and also to build the case that there is um, a very broad group of people that believe that this should be changed and, uh, and that they're people that have real experience in the military. We have a question up here from the mic. Yes, uh, Bob Miller. Uh, we were talking a few moments ago about the, the moral argument that has uh, uh, not really been illuminated very richly. What do you expect to hear or what have you heard from the church, even your own church, on this? Um, well, 
I'm not a practicing Catholic. Uh, I still have my faith, but um, I don't uh, ascribe to many of the practices of the church. Um, and uh, it's it's just a, it's a moral issue for me to be in a church that I think is so misogynistic. So I have a problem with my church leadership, but I still consider myself a, a practicing Catholic in my own way. Uh, so I don't have any, they don't influence me on these things. And um, um, while I, I listen respectfully as best I can, I know what they're going to be telling me. Uh, so that's the way that is. Um, I think the moral issue is, is very clear. Um, I believe that this is one of the last civil rights battles that we have in this country. And um, I think that it is a stain on our souls as Americans to be in the 21st century and have um, this kind of discrimination um, institutionalized by the government. And I think that it's important that we stand up for our friends and family members and good Americans that want to serve. And I think that, uh, that we will prevail on this. But it, I think the moral argument is a civil rights argument, and I think it's an important one. I think it's also very important to uh, make sure that the American people understand who these people are. They've been created as an abstract for too many people. They certainly were an abstract in 1993. And I think that you know time has worked for us. The, these, these men and women are not abstracts anymore. They're people in everyone's family. They're people in everyone's community. They're people in everyone's church. They're people in everyone's high school class, college class, people you know at work. Uh, so I think that we've been aided in this time, although it's taken too long, by the fact that this is now personal. I think that's why the American people went marched right to 75 percent and are go they're not going from 75 to 60, they're going to 75 to 80. And um, it's because uh, the bigotry and the um, fear mongering that was about this debate for too long has been um, nullified by people's personal experience. And I think frankly that's part of what the awakening of, of General Powell um, as he has described it. So, you know, I think that w we, we have the angels on our side uh, to the extent that we want them, and we've got the, the message on our side, and I think we've got right on our side. And that's why, um, you know, it's always a good time to right or wrong. I might mention we were going to have one of those uh, warriors uh, here today who's openly gay. Unfortunately, they couldn't get in and because of the plane was uh, canceled. But again, I think to make to humanize this situation, I think very very important rather than just talking in these abstract principles. Because as Dr. Frank has pointed out, and my own experience mm -hmm. tells me, they've always served the country. Yes, I mean, right. th this is really not what we're what we're talking about. Some of them are in the audience that have uh, that appear in my book also, so they are represented here today. Okay. Do we have time for one final question? Oh, okay. Well, let's. You haven't had a question, so go ahead, young lady. Take it away from the mic. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I'm an intern for the U.S. Public Service Academy, which is a piece of legislation that Representative Moran is going to be introducing very soon. Basically, what our legislation does is create a civilian West Point um, to build up our workforce of public leaders, not just our military servicemen and women. And one of the things that we talk about when we're on the Hill is how many young people this is going to attract who want to serve the country but not in the military. Um, so we think, well, we, especially young women and members of the gay and lesbian community, will flock to it and they'll apply in decently large numbers. But my question maybe for the whole panel is, um, so with the repeal that's going to happen, how long do we think it'll take before we start seeing large numbers entering of the uh, gay and lesbian community entering the military in large numbers? When is that culture shift, as you discussed earlier? What has to happen for that? Well, I just remind you that it's all, always been happening. So it, it will continue to happen. Um, there is research out of uh, UCLA that estimates that um, several thousand more gay and lesbian service members each year will consider joining and join, um, and that could happen right away. But you're, you know, you're right to, to see that there's a cultural 
phenomenon and cultural shifts take time. I don't think it will take too much time, though. Again, this is, this is about law and rhetoric catching up with reality that's already out there. And I think it's great to offer uh, all Americans both the civilian service idea and military service. And, and let me say something, and I'll give Congresswoman Tauscher the last word. <clears throat> it's going to be a non-issue. I mean, when we, this is all over, we're going to say, my goodness, what were we so worried about? Because, A, they've always been there, okay? <laughs> Most of the people there know it and don't care. Right. So. <laughs> I think what you will find is, um, I think that Dr. Frank and, and uh, Larry are right, I think what you'll find is all of a sudden um, the ranks of the military will, will have gay and lesbian people that have been serving. And all of a sudden people will realize that. And for people that are, that are serving with them, it's not, a, not an issue by and large. Um, but I'm interested in what you just said. I think muscularizing our soft power is a great idea. And I think, is it Jim, it must be Jim Moran. Yeah, and uh, you know, he's a, a, he's a great friend of mine. And you know, we, we need to have as many ways for American people to serve as possible. And um, you know, the military obviously is, is specific to what its, its roles and missions are and, and what we're going to ask of them. Um, but um, I think what you're doing is very, very interesting and I'm glad to see that you're uh, leading the way on that. But I, I thank all of you. We we have to um, we have to stay together as we have. I want to thank you know HRC and SLDN for their leadership. They've been just absolutely fabulous. And uh, I see my friend Mike Berman back there, uh, and I see Barry Carter. Um, I want to thank all of you for your support. It's been um, it's been great to be. You know, Marty Meehan first introduced this, and then he left to go to uh, the University of Massachusetts, and I took this on. And, and it's been uh, a passion of mine for a very long time, but um, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be the uh, original co-sponsor of this bill. So I appreciate your support and uh, all of your influence, and uh, just, just help us get it done. Thank you. And it was an honor to have you and Nathaniel here today and, and all of you. So thank you very much for coming. We look forward to seeing you in the future.